So without further ado, please welcome John Figdor. Thanks. Sure. Sounds like the mic is working. Okay, so I thought we'd do uh, our event set a little bit differently than I'm sure you've seen a lot of these before. I'm going to start out with a, a short little reading, and then I thought we'd have a little bit of a conversation, and then I'd jump back in and do a little bit more of a reading, and then we'll have more conversation after that. Uh, but first, let me give you a little bit of background about me and about my organization. Uh, my name is John Figdor. I'm a humanist chaplain that works with the atheist humanist agnostics at Stanford. Uh, our organization accomplishes our mission of building, educating, and nurturing a diverse community of atheists, humanists, agnostics, and the non-religious, primarily through hosting public events. I don't know if any of you have attended any of our events. We recently hosted some things with Matt Dillahunty or with uh, Reverend Barry Lynn from Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. Uh, then we also host large-scale public events. Some of you may have attended our talks with Richard Dawkins in the past. We'll have some more interesting things coming up this year. Uh, and then the third thing that we do is we provide a support for students at Stanford. Uh, we advocate for their interests and we provide some basic counseling for them. So if you're interested in hearing more about our organization, please come up and talk to me after the event. I'm happy to fill you in with more. Tonight, I'm here to talk primarily about this new book that I wrote with Lex Baer. Lex just walked in there. How are you doing, Lex? Uh, called Atheist Mind, Humanist Heart. And I thought I'd begin by telling you why I wrote the book, why we thought this was an important topic. Uh, as a chaplain, I kept meeting young people who would say, you know, John, I'm not looking for you to give me an answer, but I'm looking to have a conversation about my values, about what I care about, about what I want to do, where my priorities lie, and what I should do with my life. And as I began to think about this, I noticed that this is a problem that recurs not just for Stanford students, but many of us face it in our own lives. And so I thought maybe this book could be the beginning of a conversation people can have about what they care about, why they care about it, and where their values are. Uh, so I thought I'd begin, our topic for tonight is fairly provocative, uh, objective morality is a myth. I thought I'd start by doing a little bit of a reading to explain why we think objective morality is a myth and why that's not a bad thing, and then we'll have a little Q&A period. So, here we go. I'm going to be jumping around quite a bit, so if you've read the book, it's not going to be in order. Uh, it seems reasonable to think that if any external motivating force exists, we might be forced to choose to obey the external motivator instead of choosing to act independently and making an uncoerced choice. What do we mean by an external motivator? If choice and preference are internal motivators, then an external motivator would be something separate from ourselves and our desires that drives us to choose certain actions. For example, if a waiter held a gun to your head and said, order the fish, that would be an external <laughs> obligating factor. You're not choosing that freely of your own will. Or another example of this is the legal system, where we know that our actions have consequences, and that's part of the background calculations of whether we're going to do certain things. Uh, in heart, we can basically ask the question, does an objective moral, heart, moral truth exist? Is this the external motivator for morality? And so it seems to me like if an objective moral truth existed, it would have to exist independently of any way that a person perceives it. That means that for any moral dilemma, there would be one right answer out there. And the goal of morality would be to find that one answer. Uh, just as a belief in objective morality implies that there's a, a moral truth out there, if you do what we do and you deny the existence of a moral uh, objective reality, then we're affirming the contrary, which is a subjective morality which is the idea that morality only exists as it's interpreted and viewed by people. And so it exists naturally in many different forms in many different places. At this point, we can draw a parallel between the three core assumptions we made earlier about the nature of existence, it's a secret, I'm not telling you them yet, uh, and the starting premises we might need to make to have a meaningful system for objective moral truth. Remember, to make progress in the question of what we should believe, we laid out three core assumptions that establish three central concepts. 
the acknowledgement of existence, a method for perceiving that existence, mainly our senses, and tools for describing and thinking about that existence, being our minds and the use of language and rational thought. So to make similar progress in the field of objective morality, you'd first need to determine whether or not this morality exists, and then you'd have to figure out what kind of senses you could use in order to perceive that moral reality. So the same tools of intellect, logic, language, and thought, which is what we call definitional truths in this sense, still work for ethics, so we don't need anything new here. But for a system to be objectively moral, we need two new beliefs. One is that there's an objective moral belief, uh, sorry, moral truth. And two is that there's some kind of sensing faculty that we have that lets us find this truth. Without those two beliefs, the parallel to a belief system we constructed would fall short and you're not going to generate a coherent system. For example, if there was a moral truth but we had no means of finding it, that wouldn't help us very much. It wouldn't affect our behavior. If we had no ability to find this truth that existed, then it doesn't really matter if it exists. We can't get to it. The faculty that we use uh, for sensing what is moral and what is not is the same thing as the mind and intellect. Included with the intellect are the faculties of emotion or the heart, as we discussed earlier. These terms are merely a description of specific aspects of a person's mind's abilities. Emotions can be thought of as an impulse response that reflects deeply ingrained preferences acquired over time. And that makes our minds, which include both thoughts and emotions, our sensing faculty for perceiving ethics. That said, there are some differences. People perceive ethics substantially differently, even though their senses might give them similar answers. In particular, our intellect seems to need much more interpretation and processing to reach a moral conclusion. By comparison, our senses are uh, more mechanical in nature. They can just perceive what's before them. So take sight, for example, as compared to a moral sense. It's not that difficult for our eyes to interpret the signal sent through from light through our retina into our brain. Little subjective interpretation is necessary to understand the neural uh, circuit that's happening. In this instance, there's just a physical interaction. That's what makes it so simple to describe. Similarly, the perception of sound is caused by the physical interaction between an external entity and our sense organs. There's pressure waves that literally travel into your ear and you perceive those on your eardrum. But there's no such interaction for moral sensing. We can reduce moral feelings to the mechanism of chemical concentrations in the brain, but the repeatable interaction or communication between some external moral entity and any internal moral organ is simply just not evident. Rather, the interpretive ability of our mind in sensing morality is one that depends on the experiences we've had, not to mention our personality and our outlook. So if we're forced to decide whether our ethical senses are perceiving an objective moral truth or are forming an, a, a subjective moral reality, it certainly seems to be the latter. Now this discussion might be silly. How can we possibly think of morality the same way that we think of physical objects? But that's exactly our point. We can't. Morality cannot be thought of in the same absolute unchanging way that we think of physical things because there is an objective reality, but there isn't an objective moral truth. Let me skip around a little bit. Okay, if we can't create an objective moral truth by averaging moral preferences, maybe what we can do is design a universally binding code of ethics. Now, there have been a number of these suggested over the years. Uh, for example, Jeremy Bentham's utilitarianism, or Kant's idea of the categorical imperative, or John Rawls's idea of the veil of ignorance. Let's take utilitarianism for starters. This is the idea that moral decisions should be based on the principle of utility, or the idea of providing the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. Kant's categorical imperative, which is a different moral theory, suggests that we should only act in a way that we think everyone ought to be able to act in the same situation. 
Rawls' veil of ignorance says that we ought to make moral decisions from behind an imaginary veil of ignorance where we don't know our own relationship in society, our race, our gender, any of those things that might give us advantages or disadvantages. Now, do Bentham, Kant, or Rawls provide philosophies that meet the minimum standard of being an objective moral standard? I don't think they do. Certainly, they're universal in the sense that the authors think they can apply to all people, and there is a certain logic to using them. But that doesn't actually elevate any of them to being the one true moral code. Claiming to be universal is not the same thing as being universal. As you might guess, each one of these thinkers asserts that his own moral code is universally binding, meaning everyone has to obey it whether they want to or not. One could dream up a whole bunch of wicked moral codes and assert that they're universally applicable too. How could we decide which moral code to pick? Kant, Rawls, and Bentham each considered their own theories to be the ultimate source of moral goodness. It's unclear what a Kantian could say to a, to a utilitarian or to a Rawlsian that would change his mind radically on this view. The reason why is that imperatives demand a reason. When we hear a command, we don't just jump and do it, we ask why. To respond, to respond simply, because I said so, well that's just an appeal to authority. It's not really a reason ultimately, it's just because I said. Because we don't generally act without motivations, a command that fails to provide or at least imply a reason why we ought to follow it fails to motivate us to do anything. You might also recognize a parallel to the folly of the lottery ticket that we mentioned earlier. Choosing one exclusive moral code out of many of potential choices is a pretty dicey proposition, kind of as dicey as it is to choose the, rect the correct God. To meet the criteria of being an objective truth, these man-made moral codes would need to be objectively justified or to exist as an independent standard separate from any one abilities, individual's ability to form them. It should be added that the ideas captured by these moral theories are still meaningful and they're still worthwhile in helping us understand moral assessments. Concepts such as applying behavior universally that we get from Kant or that we ought to focus on people's suffering, which we find from utilitarianism, are actually useful observations that we can use in formulating a more uh, compassionate ethic. Having shown that we possess the ability to choose how we act, but without finding an objective moral truth, the question, how ought we behave, actually seems semantically incorrect. It falsely assumes that there is some objective external motivator dictating how we should behave. Instead, we can answer the question as follows. There's no one way we ought to behave. We choose to behave in the way that we think optimizes our life happiness. Without an implied external motivator, our behavior is dictated by the pursuit of our life happiness and by our choices rather than by any external moral obligation. Of course, our life happiness is going to be influenced by things like duty, popular opinion, ethical theories, the culture that we happen to be born into, and the religion that we happen to be born into. But even though we might choose to incorporate some of these influences into our subjective decisions, that doesn't make them objective moral standards. Rather, they're just factors that we choose or may choose not to incorporate into our ethical decision-making process. This makes our process based on our own subjective desires at heart. So that's the first part that I wanted to get to, which is about objective morality. I thought now we'd take some questions. I know people had a lot of questions about objective morality. Uh, so why don't we start, hopefully, with uh, some younger people in the beginning. I know that can be intimidating. <laughs> young folks in the back. All right, now real quick, another question. Number of questions and another question mark. So uh, I'm going to give you about 20 seconds to ask your question, and then we'll keep the conversation going, all right? I will be the mic stand, so I will yank it away. <laughs> Too much. Uh, what do you mean by morality? And if by morality you mean a distinguishing between good and bad, what do you mean by good and bad? 
Sure. So our view of morality is that there is no, is based on the view that the traditional understanding is just based on an incomplete metaphysics. So if you believe that there is one answer out there externally, that that's the one thing that we're doing, then ethics is the process of discovering that answer. Our view is not that. Our view is that ethics is based on the preferences that people have. So when we answer moral questions, we're actually asking questions about the preferences and desires of people and how those can be balanced in society. But it's a great question. Can we get a uh... quick follow-up? Yeah. Sure. So then is the word morality meaningless? No, I still think it's absolutely meaningful. In fact, Lex and I talk a lot about morality in the book. Um, and if you want a further discussion of what we talk about in terms of our redefinition of morality, I suggest you look in the book. But just off the, off the top, we can think of some behaviors that are helpful for society and some that are not. We think that cooperation lies at the heart of ethics and this idea that people can work together to form a, a whole that's better than the sum of the parts. So as a result, our view is sub morality is built from subjective preferences that are built on a cooperative framework. People who are easy to cooperate with, who are compassionate and empathetic, are going to be more successful based on some game theory research. And there's some work uh, Professor Axelrod has done in evolution of cooperation that backs this up. I think you just started uh, on what my question is, but um, do you go in any to the brain chemistry and the endorphins that are released when we do things like cooperate? Sure, so we don't talk a lot about what happens in the brain during cooperation, but we do mention the concept of mirror neurons, which is the idea that when you see another person smiling, someone who's close to you, the same neurons start to fire in your brain. You have this kind of neurological reaction, which shows you that uh, identification with others and caring about other people is literally hardwired into us. It's built into our neurology. <coughs> I know that you based, first of all, the, the uh, screen says objective reality, you're talking about objective morality. Morality, sorry. Good. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> there is definitely an objective reality, yeah. Okay, uh, I noticed you, you based your objective morality not existing on the concept that we cannot subjectively uh, feel or, or see this morality or understand right. it. What do you think about Sam Harris's point? that objective morality can be determined through science if we base morality upon the happiness of sentient beings. Right. Act actions increase happiness, certain, happen certain actions decrease happiness. You can turn out that. So I think Sam is kind of arbitrarily picking the standard of the happiness of, of organisms. I think it's a good standard. So we actually pick the same standard for our book, but we don't choose to pretend like the moral system that we can create is objective. Um, let's take a step back and think of it in two kinds of views. Uh, so one version of morality has it that before there were any organisms that were capable of being murdered, you know, in the, at the plant stage of evolution, they believed that it was still wrong to murder people. Uh, it's a coherent view to have. It means that there's certain moral truths that exist out in nature and they're true respective of whether or not there's a person. Our view is a little bit different. Our view is before there were organisms that were capable of interacting in a moral way, there really was no such thing as morality. And then once the first organisms developed that had a complicated enough neurology to understand each other and to understand their environment, they started using cooperative behaviors. And through these cooperative behaviors, they essentially built a system of subjective ethics. So the best thing that you can hope to attain, in our view, is everyone's perspective. But that still doesn't make it objective. That's just, every, that's just everyone's opinion counts, which is a good thing. Uh, so you can never quite get to objectivity. I think Sam Harris, is, his book is really brilliant. I love the idea of the moral landscape as a metaphor. It works very well. But I don't think he can claim that his system is objective. I think all he's doing is saying we ought to base it on the subjective preferences of organisms, which is ultimately very similar to our view. I have a problem with uh, cooperation. I mean, war is a very cooperative endeavor. Yeah. Sure. And we can all believe that killing people that uh, happen to believe something or happen to 
exist on a piece of land we want right. is good for us. What does cooperation have to do with anything? So our view is cooperation is how morality starts, right? It's obvious that there can be different forms of moral, uh, of conflict, right? So if we take two populations of animals that are sharing one habitat, say it's a watering patch, uh, if one group of animals comes in and drinks all the water, that has really terrible consequences for the other people there. But ultimately what we're talking about is people's preferences. It's the preferences of the animals to drink the water and the preferences of the other animals not to have their water being taken. Our view is that ultimately, people are going to have different preferences and they're going to collide. And people are gonna make their case to society that this is my view, this is my understanding. And then the other side will come in and give their view of why they think they ought to use these resources. And people have a dispute about it. The fact that we don't acknowledge that there isn't one correct answer doesn't mean that we can't uh, discriminate silly views from responsible views. For example, uh, Take the tax code in our country, which is pretty goofy. We have a system in which domestic violence shelters don't share half of the tax benefits that churches enjoy, even though domestic violence shelters provide an obvious benefit to society. Um, where was I going with that? Uh, so the ultimate idea that, uh, you know, the idea that we can choose one moral, one view over another is we can just refer to. Uh, kind of the reasons given for these views. So if one person says, my view is to take as many resources uh, as I possibly can and I don't care what happens to other people, we can say to that person, are you sure that's your view? Are you sure that you would be happier if everyone else around you was suffering and miserable and you know your kids were going to a school that wasn't good because you didn't care about the local ecosystem? So our point is that you can still reason with people across subjective differences. Just because there's no one correct answer doesn't mean that we can't eliminate good answers and bad answers along the way. Yeah, let's do a couple more. Uh, you seem to concede that uh, morality is in some sense about helpfulness, and I believe you just use the word terrible and suffering. Um, about so, avoiding uh, suffering. <laughs> avoiding suffering. Uh, but my, my second question then is uh, you seem to be proposing that there is uh, no way to determine suffering, but is suffering not uh, just an aspect of our physical? Brain? Is, is the mind not a merchant property of the brain? Is sure. Is it not determine who suffers more than someone else? Sorry, are you saying that we can determine? I mean, first of all, we have people's own feedback. So someone who says they suffer, they can ask them, why are you suffering? And if they say, you know, I, I broke my wrist yesterday, that's a good reason to have that, right? So does that answer what you're saying? Uh, no, I'm, I'm more so wondering if you think it's possible to determine if we can figure out who's suffering more than someone else. So for example, uh, you might you might believe, sure. you know, they, uh, outside of any sort of measurement or anything like that, that um, someone who has a broken arm suffers less than someone who is violently raped and beaten to death. Um, and I would probably concur that uh, someone who is violently raped and beaten to death suffers more. Um, but these are physical manifestations of the brain, inevitably. I, I assume we agree on that. Um, right. So are they not? determinable in the sense that we can determine who suffers more. I'm sorry, is your question, can we determine who suffers more between any two persons? I mean, so doctors have a pain scale that they use in determining how much medication they're going to give people. If, does that answer what you're talking about? Yeah, we definitely can make interpersonal comparisons of suffering. I think the question of how fine grain they can be is a reasonable thing to say, but there's no reason to think that just because a person says something and it's based on their experience that we can't verify it. We can't kind of run it through our heads and say, is that how we would act in that situation? Does that seem to make sense? We have to be a little bit scientific about things and investigate into them. You mentioned uh, science and the term successful. Right. The groups that are cooperative and compassionate are successful. Doesn't that imply some kind of objective standard? No, not quite. Uh, I mean, are you saying that survival would be the objective standard? Well, you, you, I want to know what you mean yeah, by successful. 
so yeah, it, to me, it just doesn't sound like there is any, there's no way to make that an objective standard. It seems like survival is a good value for people. I certainly want it. I think almost every other person prefers to continue to exist. But that doesn't make it objective at the end of the day. Even if all of us choose it, it doesn't elevate it to being true, objectively true. Because the way that we keep saying is, think about, for example, what, what would happen if the Earth were obliterated by an asteroid at some point? The question is, would morality just continue even though all human life had been lost and there were no other organisms alive? I mean, the question would be, does it make sense to talk about morals if there are no moral agents? And our view is it's much more likely that moral agents created morality than to just assert that there exists out there this thing called morality and we can have access to it and that thing is binding on everyone. All right, so I think that at this point I'll do a little bit more reading and we'll get into the subjective ethics part and then we can have a little bit more conversation and questions. Does that work for you guys? All right. So it starts with the golden rule. We like to start with the, the classics, right? So the most universally accepted way of thinking about morality is in terms of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We know this because we've seen it generated in every society that exists, from Confucian society to uh, ancient uh, tribal cultures to Indian philosophy, all the way in basically every uh, civilization develops this rule at some point. In light of our understanding of our preference for happiness, we can actually recast this rule in our frame and say, choose to help others find happiness just as you seek happiness for yourself. But the golden rule attempts to tell us what we ought to do. Didn't we just discredit the idea of moral oughts since there's no objective moral truth? Yes, but notice that as we've now paraphrased it, the golden rule is consistent with choice. We choose to act morally because our personal preferences are to act in that way. And since those personal preferences so often line up with societal morality because of enlightened self-interest and because of our identification with others, we end up with an uncomplicated conclusion. We choose to be moral because of the happiness that it brings us. The idea that morality depends on our view of life happiness is best explained by the ex philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre in uh, the famous example of a young man in France during World War II faced with the decision of whether he should stay home and help his ailing mother-in-law, sorry, mother, or he should go and join the French resistance and fight the Nazi occupiers. Sartre notes that universal moral and ethical theories are very much unhelpful to this situation since both options are valid moral choices. It seems like it would be hard to say that one of these is right and the other one is wrong. There is no universally correct answer for what that young man ought to do. Rather, the decision that he makes is based on what the young man views as most valuable. If he stays home with his mother, he demonstrates his commitment to the idea of uh, compassion for the sick and uh, caring for his family. If he joins the resistance, he demonstrates that his moral compass prioritizes bravery, patriotism, and standing up for one's friends. The point is that the young man's moral compass, like all of our moral compasses, is determined by his own preferences. If you're the sort of person who is made happy by caring for others, you'll be inclined towards a moral perspective that emphasizes looking out for sick people or people who need help. Alternatively, if you're the type of person who is made happy by your autonomy and freedoms, your moral compass might choose to prioritize standing up for freedoms in the face of oppression. To put it another way, a young man who decides to be a doctor isn't morally superior or inferior to a young woman who decides to become a UN peacekeeper. He is simply made happier in the long run by following his preference to practice medicine. Now the link between happiness and moral decision making isn't a new idea. The Greek hedonists of the fourth century BCE, the Epicureans of the first century CE, and the utilitarians of the 20th century all saw happiness as the greatest moral good, either for the individual or for society. The conclusion that we've reached is a little bit different. 
uh, because we're not saying that acting out of rational self-interest and identifying with others, uh, Sorry, we are saying that acting out of rational self-interest and identifying with others often leads to moral behaviors. We follow our life happiness preferences not out of some moral imperative, but because that's how we inherently behave. It's not overcoming our nature, it is our nature. It is, ra sorry, is it rational to believe in our own systems of ethics if our preferences have been so deeply ingrained by our upbringing? This is a great question. To answer this, each one of us has to decide, regardless of the influence of others, whether our current set of ethics is the best way we know to lead a happy life within our society. Much moral wisdom has emerged in human history. Our choice to follow any of these guiding principles is a choice to accept the testimony of other people who have supposedly lived happy lives and who have ideas of how other people can. Historically, a good deal of morality was taught to us by our parents and society and is derived from religion. Does it matter if dad taught us that we should respect others because it was God's will? Isn't it the outcome that actually matters? As adults, we can each choose whether or not to follow any particular moral view espoused by religion. In making such a choice, we may believe in respecting people not for religious reasons, but because it makes us happy. The system of morals proposed by religions have often been interpreted and modified by society over time. The link between ethics and God has long been used by religion as a source of both knowledge and as a way to justify behavior that leads to happiness in societies. But even if we disregard religion or God as an external motivator for morality, there's still no need to disregard many of these reasonable principles that religions have developed and practiced in order to promote healthy societies. It goes without saying that the moral preferences each of us adopts includes a strong bias towards the experiences we've encountered in life, including the way that we were raised, the culture in which we grew up, and whether you've been uh, victimized by some particular thing. For example, if you've been hurt by lying, then truthfulness is likely to be very important to you. If you've been praised for helping others, then you're likely to place a very high premium on that kind of behavior. Family and friends will usually have played a large part in shaping and understanding your moral preferences and your happiness. The link between our own morals and our own upbringings is inescapable. Instead of rejecting this as an arbitrary influence, we must accept it as a consequence of subjective morality. Each of our views on morality is inextricably linked to ourselves, to our environment, to our own life and to our own experiences. However, this shouldn't give us pause. Just as we accept a good moral principle, even if it's historically grounded in a bad reason and reject a bad one, so too do we accept the good influences of our background and we can reject the bad. So that's our view of uh, moral happiness. I'd like to take a couple more questions here. Do you have any problem with the, uh, the label relativism? And uh, why do you think so many people make over objective sure. because they're afraid of that word? I think people are afraid of relativism in a very serious way. I think that as soon as they admit that people's that ultimately morality relates to people's opinions and viewpoints, they get worried that that means that we can't have a rational conversation anymore. However, that's just simply not the case. Take, uh, you know, take two people, one of them says, I want to become a teacher, the other says, I want to be an axe murderer. You ask them, why do you want to do this? The axe murderer says, well, I get this voice in my head and he keeps telling me to do this. Well, that doesn't seem like a very good reason to me. Like, we can actually reason with this person and we can say, it's more probable, actually, that there's something wrong with your brain chemistry. Here, try this schizophrenia uh, solution. In any case, the, the point is that uh, just because people claim to have viewpoints doesn't make their viewpoint rational and doesn't make it compelling for other people. I mean, people have all sorts of preferences. We tend to care about people's reasonable and logical preferences a lot more than we care about their arbitrary and weird ones. So to me, uh, 
I mean, to some extent, there is relativism because we're admitting that different people are different and they're going to have different experiences. But that doesn't seem to be a problem in any way. In fact, you still seem to be faced with the similar problem from an objective view. It's just interpreting, it just manifests itself in how you apply these objective moral rules. I'm going to ask you a quick question. Um, oftentimes, when I talk to theists, I ask them for an example of an objective morality. Right. And a lot of times, one of the answers I get, the canned answer, is torturing babies for fun is objectively wrong. And what do you think about that? Also, sure. Matt Dillon you often says that he believes that objective moral truths can be found, which life is preferable to death, right. pleasure preferable to pain, that kind of thing. Do you think that that's objectively true, or are they just? I disagree with Matt that those are objective truths. I think that they're compelling, and I, and I believe them. Uh, so take this idea of uh, torturing a baby, which is just like an awful concept. Um, it seems logical to say that that's just the opinion that's correct. But we have to ask ourselves, objective morality isn't just saying that that's the opinion. It's that that's the opinion, and it doesn't matter about any one person's view. It doesn't, it doesn't relate to actual people. So you do end up in this absurd situation in the end where if the Earth got struck by a meteor and all people ceased to exist, they would have to then say that all these things are still, that you know, torturing a baby for hours is wrong, even though there's now no longer any organisms in the set baby, and even though there's no longer any organisms in the set human being. So to believe in objective morality, you have to believe that a set can have parameters even if it has no objects inside it. And I'm not good at math, but that doesn't sound kosher. Uh, it seems to me that for the health of a society, some kind of objective viewpoint on morality is necessary. In the United States, we have uh, uh, in alienable rights, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right, and All why do we have those rights? But whether or not they are given to us by God or by evolution or what, that's, that's uh, the point that I'm making is that it seems where you're coming from, I get the feeling that you would maybe object to a society, a culture, a civilization having some kind of standard like the life to uh, the right to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness is the basis for morality. And if you do that, if you're entirely subjective, then what's to prevent the next president from saying, well, from my point of view, uh, we're going to do away with the life aspect or the liberty aspect because these are purely subjective. So it seems that civilizations maybe need to have an objective standard of uh, to sure. Base their morality on. Sure. So let me answer you. So it's a good question. Uh, I think what you're saying is, why does our society have the values that they have? We've picked these objective truths. We've chosen to make them true. But the point is that we have the political system that we have and the legal system that we have because of history, because it happened to work out in a certain way, and because the people who developed our system had a certain view of preferences. At the time, their preferences were very different from the King of England, who preferred that we would stay a colony. They thought we'd be better off on our own. And so they made a choice independent of whatever the king thought. Ultimately, when we developed our, our country, when we wrote the Declaration of Independence, when we decided what the norms of our country were going to be, we chose together and wrote something called a contract, right? This is refers to the idea of the social contract invented by Thomas Hobbes, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and uh, there's a third one there, yeah, Locke, thank you. Uh, so this is what our system is based on, is actually the idea that, uh, that Locke has of civilizations is made up of people who come together to choose to give up certain rights, like for example, the right to commit murder, in exchange to get other rights. This is a wholly self-created view of morality. This doesn't relate to any objective view up there. What it is is that people in the society come together and they say, these are our preferences, these are our values, this is what we care about, this is what we want to protect. It doesn't really matter if there, it, the objective morality doesn't make a difference here. As long as you can have those coherent conversations and you can have that argument, that's all you need in order to have rational thought. 
for at least tens of thousands of years, if not hundreds of thousands of years. People have lived in Aboriginal tribes. And more often than not, we, we believe that they fought with each other, and it was the duty of a tribes person to kill the enemy tribe. And when they captured those enemy tribe people, they often tortured them brutally. Right. So do those people have morality? And how does that fit in with what your position is on? So I think when we're talking about people in other points in time, it's very hard for us to judge from our current understanding. Uh, for example, if we take uh, any of these problems that have, that have historically been issues, if you have more information, it makes it much easier to solve the problem. So take the idea of like murdering fellow tribes, right? At one point in time, we thought that the best strategy was just pure brutal warfare. This is what's theorized in the idea of the, uh, the social contract. In the state of nature, before you have the uh, formation of society, people are just brutal. And this is what you see in places that don't have any government anymore. People take lives freely, they steal freely, there's no one to defend basic principles. Um, now, the reason that it matters that uh, the reason that we can actually condemn these views and we can say it doesn't make sense is because we say, if you had more information, if you knew more about human development, if you knew more about morality, you'd be able to make a better decision in those circumstances. So we can look back, and I don't know how many of you have read Steven Pinker's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, but he draws a scientific conclusion that society is beneficial for people. And he shows this through your odds of being killed uh, by a you know, uh, violent act, you know, get murdered in the night. And the answer is that as civilization proceeds and as we come together and create more laws and create a more just and more defined society, the amount of violence that individuals face is remarkably reduced. So at the end of the day, uh, you can actually prove scientifically that it's in our best interest to have uh, at least a certain moral norm for our society. And you can build those moral norms subjectively based on the preferences of people in that society. And this is actually important because it helps explain a feature of morality, which is that it looks different in different places. So in the US, we have a strong value placed on individualism and on people taking what's theirs and standing up for their own. Uh, in China, where they have a Confucian heritage, things look a little bit different, and there's much more a focus on the family and a thought of how will my decisions affect my parents, my grandparents, my brothers, my sisters, my extended family. Does this make their moral system incoherent or bad? I would say no. It reflects the fact that they choose to organize their society based on the idea of family, based on those principles. Those are coherently defended and logically argued for principles. It makes sense to me. Uh, out here, we do things slightly differently. We don't necessarily base things on family. We choose things based on individuality. But we can give reasons for why we think that's best. So the advantage of saying that morality is subjective is that you can explain why one culture says it's extremely important that we take care of the elderly, so much so that in, uh, I believe it's in Taiwan, there's a law that requires that children, sorry, once they hit the age of like 18 or something, pay for the upkeep of their elderly grandparents. They have to check in on them X number of times. And it's because that culture bakes into it a very strong belief in, in family values and connecting to your family. That seems like a perfectly fine thing to me, but it also seems fine that we not have that law in this country. We just have a different preference in that case. Anybody? I just want to show that someone hasn't asked a question yet. It's a chance. We seem to be placing a lot of faith on our innate ability to determine moral actions by our own happiness. But California, not too long ago, passed Proposition 8 by a pretty high majority. And from my standpoint, banning same-sex marriage is just, there's no gray area. That's just, there's, you know, there's no, nothing gained by banning it, and there's a lot of harm. Uh, so, is most of California just morally efficient, or what is that? 
Sure, so I think if you were to use our moral framework to ask the question about gay marriage, you'd have to say, is there any harm that's happening? Is there, is there a victim here? And you'd have to listen to arguments about what the harms were. Now, I've, we've done this as a society for basically the past decade, and it seems pretty clear that there is little harm caused by gay marriage. I certainly can't think of any. And in the absence of a harm, we're just supposed to believe that there's some kind of magical damage that happens? That makes no sense to me. So from our perspective, if you followed through the, the logic of the book, you'd look at the evidence out there and you'd apply the scientific method to that evidence and you'd say, is that a reasonable conclusion to reach? And to me, it just doesn't seem to be reasonable. It seems like you have to assert that, the, that there's some kind of harm, and I just haven't heard a good one yet. Hey, John. Yeah. I have a question. If morals were passed down from a god, how would we even know? So in a sense, I'm sure. really asking, why does it really matter? Sure, I think the reason it matters is that one of the most uh, well-known moral theories, although it's probably one of the worst, is called divine command theory. This is the idea that things are moral because God commands them to be so. But this seems just like openly ridiculous. That means that you know God could change his mind tomorrow and like murder would be a good thing all of a sudden and then we'd all have to change our minds and start murdering people. It just doesn't make any sense. So divine command, the only reason that I think the uh, nature of ethics residing in God is significant is because of divine command morality, which is, it happens in, you see it in Christian theocratic circles in like the very deep south, and then you do see it abroad in some other contexts. But I, I don't think it's a very valid moral theory. I don't think it has any serious proponents in the modern day. Well, I think that kind of goes into my question comment. I mean, of more objective morality is a myth by Take, I've sort of recast it as objective morality comes from a myth, which yeah. is pretty much the whole uh, God decided how it should be. And that you mentioned people being afraid of relativism. And it seems like that somehow uh, about how if there's relativism, it means that their objective reality they put together uh, is being doubted or sure. that you, you know, I'm, I'm trying to suss out what it is that, that going on there? Sure, the uh, great question. The fear about relativism is that if we admit that values are relative and that different people can have different values and that one of them isn't just right at the end of the day about what the best value is, people say, oh, well, then how do you even have a conversation then? If it, it just seems arbitrary and capricious. But that's not the way that things actually work. Uh, we could say, you know, it, 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 for any goal that you have, you could entertain two different possible ways of getting to that goal, and you can assess which one makes more sense and which one makes less sense. So in my view, even if we admit morality is subjective, that doesn't mean that we can't compare two different interpretations. You know, if uh, one person says, my belief is we ought to uh, invest a, a lot of money in uh, education for our society because kids of the future, we're gonna need scientists to solve the technological problems that we're facing. And then the other person says, we should just spend 100% of our GDP on national defense and build Fortress America and you know, have enormous, we'd say, well, what's the logic behind that? Well, what, would the, what would the consequences of that view be? And what would the consequences of this other view be? And we can actually weigh that. And this is how our society works. You know, when we come to elections, People put up different views of what they think we ought to do as a society, and then we actually vote, and we choose locally how we want to live. Uh, so we make these kinds of comparisons across admittedly subjective values all the time. It's just a bogeyman when we talk about it in the field of ethics for some reason. So now we have about 15 minutes left. Do you have anything else you need to do from the book that you want to do? No, let's just keep going Q&A. This is fun. Okay, I'll go back. Back here, I just want to people who haven't asked a question yet. So you're, you're talking about uh, comparing these different things. Are, is that comparison then based on objective things or subjective no. things, or how are you comparing? 
so again, it's gonna have to be based on people's subjective experiences. Remember, before we mentioned briefly that someone who had been uh, victimized by lying is going to be hypersensitized to lying. Thus, their own ethics might be very much about following the letter of the law to a T. Another person might have a view of ethics of uh, you know, doing the most good for the most number of people. And in that case, the truth isn't so important to that person, whereas caring for other people is. Now, those two people can have a discussion between them about their values, but it's not clear to me that one of these values is just obviously superior to the other. Sometimes the answer is there's no ultimate answer for a good reason. It's because both of these things are important, and we wouldn't do well as a society if we didn't have people pursuing both paths. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of conflation and equivocation between, um, for example, subject and relativist. Uh, so for example, if you were to say, what is the distance to the minimum, um, obviously that is relative to where you are. Right. Um, in that context, I don't see how we can't admit that there is a relativistic moral system that is relative to the person and their experience, uh, but there is still an objective value that we can determine what is the actual distance between these two objects, or what is the amount of suffering that this person feels or something. Sorry, so I don't actually believe that you can just, I think that we can kind of draw broad generalities about people's suffering, but I don't think that we can literally take each one of us and assign to us a number that's our suffering number. I think some people who have experienced, you know, it's just interpersonal comparisons are okay to an extent, but they're not that precise. And it's not a matter of we're just going to add up the numbers and come out to the right answer. It's, it really is difficult to compare between two people their levels of suffering. All we have is this kind of vague language that we can use to describe it. It's the best we've got, but it's not good enough to make anything that we're doing here objective, right? Because it's based on such a subjective perception, such a subjective experience. I, I think the, the practice of morality, the system of ethics is uh, subjective. I think that the standard on which morals are based perhaps it's objective. I look at it as I would uh, gravity, for instance. Gravity is a fact, a universal fact. And, but gravity operates differently in different places. And sometimes you have to uh, fight gravity. You have to jump up in the air to avoid some uh, object that you're going to stumble on or something. Mm -hmm. And I think that morality is somewhat similar. Morality acts uh, differently on different people and different cultures. But in general, I think there is a standard by which we can, which we can refer to. And that standard comes about as a basis of uh, um, evolution. And mankind has evolved in such a way that we have certain predilections toward cooperation. We need food, we need sustenance, we need psychological nourishment, physical sure. nourishment. So I think that that, would that be an objective standard on which to base morality? No, so there's really, uh, the problem is, uh, I'm not sure that we're, we're understanding what objective means in this sense. For something to be objectively true, it would have to be something that, it, that was true for all people at all time. It would have to just be true and exist apart from the nature of things as they are here. Uh, and it just doesn't seem logical to me to believe that that's the nature of morality. If we think about it for a minute, um, your perspective of saying, uh, any one of these laws is a good thing to have and that these help societies advance. Yeah, but there was a time when we didn't actually have these laws and society was operating before those happened and it wasn't great. I mean, for a long time we had the institution of slavery in this country where we thought it was fine to actually own people like their farm equipment. And then we actually learned over time that geez, these people are suffering, they're real human beings. More information was added to the equation. Southerners read these newspaper articles that were arguing for uh, why black people should be treated as human beings. And eventually the culture changed its mind on this question, it was convinced by it. That's how morality evolves. Well, morality if there was an was answer. The same, the morality existed was the same. Slavery has been wrong 
for all time based on objective standards. S sorry, are you saying slavery was wrong before there were any organisms that could possibly be enslaved? So at time one of the universe, so the Big Bang happens now immediately after that, are you saying slavery is wrong beginning then? Yes, I'm saying it's wrong in the same sense that so, gravity, gravity existed potentially. So you're making claims the, about... Before the Earth was here, there was sorry, no gravity. So the only way we can learn about morality is to hear from people's preferences and their actual experiences of this. Where's your evidence in morality? It's the experience of people. The problem is if there's no people, then there's no experience to base laws on. So why would, why would stealing be wrong at time one in the universe? What's the logical reason for this? It's just asserted. You're just saying it's true that it's always been the case. But I'm telling you, no. The reason that anything that exists right now is a law is a law is because people tried over time to develop their systems to come to uh, uh, a collaborative view of morality, and this is the best negotiation that we've come up with. Is it the perfect view of morality? No, I'm sure there's all sorts of things. In fact, the one that I'm most concerned of is vegetarianism. I think I might actually be wrong about vegetarianism. If I learned more about the problem and really found out more about the suffering of animals, I might have a different opinion about the subject. So we have to admit that if we're willing to change our mind based on new evidence, we're probably not referring to an objective phenomenon that's true regardless of anyone's experience. We're talking about making ethics in light of people's preferences and experiences. Let's maybe do one or two more. Just looking at time, yeah. Yeah, I love that. Well, I question uh, what you said because they think that the Bible has been used Sure. What's your question, though? <laughs> My question is, I don't, why are you claiming, does this example mean nothing uh, that, that, uh, about the primates uh, that, uh, and that you feel, you feel that uh, they're, that, <laughs> I don't know, it's a question. It, it, are you suggesting maybe that, the, that the, the monkeys that have a, a friendlier disposition have a better survival rate or something like that? Is that the type of argument you're trying to make? No, the point I'm trying to make is that, 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 that I don't think that people, uh, way to until civilization came along, to be cooperative. It probably depended a lot on the, the, the environment and a lot of other things, but it, they didn't have to wait for civilization. That's my Sure, so this is a thought experiment that the way that civilizations were formed was early people decided, hey, uh, you know, imagine that we're in the Paleolithic age and there's those woolly mammoths running around and saber-teethed tiger, and I say to Brian, I'm really getting sick of watching people get picked off by these saber-teethed tiger at night. Like every night we go to sleep around the fire and they drag one of these, it was Jeff last night, it sucks for Jeff. We heard him screaming all night. You can't get a good night's sleep anymore. So I say, Brian, here's the deal. Um, don't smash my head in with a rock, and you can get eight hours of sleep where I'll keep watch out and let you know if we have to run away from the tiger. And then after you're done, I'll take eight hours and sleep, and you not smash my head in with a rock while that happens. And this works, because Brian and I then have a better survival mechanism than other people who are just getting ripped out of the fire. And eventually more people say, hey, Brian and John, they have a kind of good thing going. They seem to not get eaten by saber-teethed tigers as much. Maybe I should offer to work with them. And so you can kind of, I know I'm talking in really broad strokes here, but this is the idea that you have, uh, you find similar values, you find similar objectives, and then you, you cooperate to accomplish those goals. And this is what uh, Axelrod is talking about in the evolution of cooperation, where he argues that if you actually look at it uh, from a game theory perspective and you run these tests over many iterations, the strategies that are most successful are strategies that are broadly nice, meaning that they will respond. If someone is, is mean to them, they'll respond with force.
force, but their natural inclination is to be receptive to offers and to be receptive to openness. And we've shown that in the lab, this actually works as a better strategy, gets you more resources in the end than even more brutal and you know, conniving and Machiavellian strategies which might work in the short term, but don't necessarily play out well in the long term of society. So uh, did you want to do? So let's do one more. And if there's somebody who has not asked a question yet, this is your chance. Our treasurer has a question. OK, this might be a little bit of a tangent, but just um, so if we, if we take for granted that it's not objective, um, uh, let me, let me just say, well, I would personally claim that peace would be a more ethical way as opposed to conflict. So around the world, we have um, many different, obviously, subjective moralities. Uh, could you just com com uh, comment on how do we reconcile these, these different views? Sure. Well, I think that the way that we reconcile society's different views is just a macrocosmic view of what happens when two individuals with different views happen. So we actually have a debate about which values are best and which values work. We see this actually happening in American society. We've, seen it, we've watched it happen in our lifetimes with the issue of gay marriage. I remember growing up in New York, uh, it's definitely not the, the view that we have today. Kids were picked on for being gay. There was a lot of bullying. Uh, it was a different time. And people eventually heard from gay people's stories. They found out that, not to be stereotypical here, but their hairdresser was gay, or their uncle was gay, or their, you know, it, any person that they knew was gay. And that changed their view on the subject. They began to think, well, gay people aren't just this exterior image that I have. They're people that I know, and they're people that I relate to. And based on that evidence, they thought to themselves, is it right to stop them from marrying people that they love? And people came to the conclusion, no. And that's where we sit in the majority of states at this point, and we're about to watch in the next, what, like maybe five, 10 years, it become basically every state in the country. So this is how you can have a debate across these values and come to a conclusion. It doesn't mean that the right answer is gay marriage. That's not the, that's not the point of this. It's not to say that there's one objective truth. What it is to say is that our best view right now, supported by the evidence, is that gay marriage is not harmful and ought to be supported. And that's what we do in the system. The best that we can ever accomplish is this is our best science now. In our way, our view of uh, ethics is a little bit like the scientific method, in that you never prove something true, you just eliminate it as not untrue, right? So no s number of scientific experiments proves a fact to be true. All we can say is it's su survived this many rounds of disconfirmation. So that's the way that we're looking at it. It's not that anything that society has chosen is the correct answer. It's just that that's what we're currently thinking is the best answer. And it's subject to change over time based on people's preferences, their desires, and even realities about nature. So if we suffer from a global warming problem and have vastly fewer resources, that's going to exacerbate a lot of these problems. OK, well, let's give John a big hand. And I just wanted to mention, if you're interested in, <laughs> if you're interested in reading more about this subject, the book is Atheist Mind, Humanist Heart. I didn't bring any copies to sell today because we're not trying to sell books. But if you're interested, we'd love to see you buy a copy online and leave us a review. It's the conversation that we're finding most interesting, and we'd love to hear what you guys have to think. Where? So it's on Amazon. Amazon.com. Of course, on Amazon. So yeah. Or any website like that. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thanks, Thanks so much.